on charter of rights for people with dementia and carers. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. To those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on James Kelly to open the debate. Seven minutes or thereabouts, Mr Kelly, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to host the members' debate this evening on a charter of rights for people with dementia and carers. And I'd like to thank uh, all the members from across the chamber who have signed the motion uh, and given uh, support to this important issue. I think the, the starting point, obviously, is to understand the issue that we're dealing with. Um, we obviously have a, a growing elderly population in Scotland, and part of the, the, part of the, 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 one of the things that comes from that is that, unfortunately, we're seeing a growing number of people who suffer from dementia. Uh, clearly, this is a, a very difficult condition uh, for those uh, who, do, who do suffer from dementia, and it's also difficult for their families and their, their, their carers. Uh, they suddenly, in the latter stages of their life, enter a, a very kind of vulnerable position, and it becomes difficult for them to understand, and also difficult for those around them to give them proper su support. I mean, in Glasgow alone, over 8,000 people suffer from dementia, and that shows you the size and the scale of the problem. And from that point of view, I think it is very important to reinforce the importance of rights for people with dementia and also for their carers. I, in this debate, I want to pull together uh, several strands which reinforce the importance of a charter of rights for people with dementia and carers. I think as a starting position, uh, it's important to go back to say that there was a motion passed in the, or a motion adopted in the Parliament in 2009, um, which was really put together by the cross-party group on Alzheimer's. Uh, and I want to pay tribute to the work that former MSP Irene Oldfather did in that group. And also, <laughs> and also on, on that motion, particularly on the issue of the, the Charter of Rights. I know that Irene Oldfather is in the gallery this evening and continues to champion this, this issue as a director of, of Alliance. So that, that was the forerunner for uh, flagging up this very important issue and starting in train a lot of very important work. I think there's nothing more uh, personifies the campaign around this issue than the work of uh, Tommy Whitelaw who's done a lot of work with Alliance and also uh, has been at the forefront of the Carer's Voice uh, project uh, as part of Alliance. Uh, Tommy, uh, his, Tommy's mother was diagnosed uh, with dementia and he cared for her for five years until she sadly passed away in 2012. But it's a mark of the person that Tommy Whitelaw was that even after his mother's passing, he embarked on a, a very intensive campaign to make people aware of the issue. Many of the parliamentarians uh, have come across him, not just here in the parliament, but on his various tours throughout the country. He had 85 conversations with health professionals. He enlisted 14,000 pledges from people, and he's been to 600 locations. And I think it's important not just to pay tribute to that work, but to look at some of the key findings of the work. And what he found in speaking to people with dementia and also their carers was that one of the, the difficulties that they, they struggled with was just the, the loneliness as they tried to face up to the condition that they faced. They had really diffi real, real difficulty with f feeling that they were being on their own and not properly supported. There's also a frustration around that. Um, it's frustrating enough having an illness, but I think particularly with the, the illness of dementia, there's a real frustration as you, you, you try to come to terms with what's happening in your life. And also there are, there are serious economic challenges uh, as people are needed to be supported. And the reality is that uh, care throughout the country uh, is not always consistent uh, and is not always to the, the quality that we would like. And these were some of the findings that Tommy found um, in his work. Uh, I also want to pay tribute to the work that Age Scotland have done. Uh, I mean, one of the things that they've done is they've worked very closely with the STUC 
in order to focus on the rights of people uh, at work who uh, have started to suffer from dementia. It's, it's important to realise that dementia is, is something that people can start to suffer at a younger age when they're still working or even as we've, we've got a, an elderly working population. And it's important that people should be able to try and keep as much normality in their life as possible and be able to continue to work. And the work that Age Scotland and the STUC have done uh, have reinforced that. I think uh, the importance of a, a rights-based approach is absolutely crucial because it gives uh, people with dementia uh, a voice uh, it helps them to make a difference and it looks to maintain and, and help and build on uh, and improve their, uh, their quality of life. I know in looking at all these strands today, the Scottish Government have worked uh, very, very constructively with the different organisations and today they have published a, a new dementia uh, strategy and I think this is a very welcome contribution. There are three points to the strategy. Uh, one is... Uh, supporting timely person-centred care. Uh, secondly, making progress on the provision of support. And thirdly, uh, responding to the fact that there's an increasing number of older people uh, with dementia. Uh, I think that the strategy is very much welcome. And I think there's been a lot of progress made since the original motion that I mentioned earlier was lodged in 2009. But I do think that there's much more can be done to support people with dementia and also their carers. I think uh, a rights-based approach uh, would help uh, vitally in that area. So I hope that people are able to make contributions from across the chamber, which will not, on will not only inform the Scottish Government's work going forward, but will actually make a difference, uh, not just to ongoing uh, budgets and strategy, but actually make a difference to people out in the country who are having to uh, deal with the consequences of dementia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. Open debate, speeches of four minutes, please. A call clear hockey to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms Hockey, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And I would like to refer members to my register of interest, in particular to the fact that I'm a registered mental health nurse still in clinical practice. And I would like to thank James Kelly uh, for bringing this motion forward for debate in Parliament. I doubt there is a family in Scotland who has not experienced the loss of a loved one through dementia. And I mean loss in all meanings of the word. As many of us know, dementia takes our loved ones away from us little by little, day by day. Currently, it's estimated there are 855,000 people living in the UK with dementia, a figure expected to rise to a million by 2021. But dementia is not a disease in itself. Dementia is a word used to describe a group of symptoms that occur when brain cells stop working properly. And this happens inside specific areas of the brain which affect how you think, how you remember and how you communicate. Over time, it affects a person's ability to make judgments and to act in their own interests. And the condition severely compromises their ability to protect their own rights. And this is why the rights-based approach taken by the Charter of Rights and subsequent policy work that places an individual rights, individual's rights at the core of a person-centred approach is so important. We should remember that people with dementia are individuals first and foremost, and that their care should take into account their own unique personal circumstances, their needs and their wishes, as well as the needs of their family and carers. The Charter has taken the United Nations endorsed panel approach and this focuses on the rights of everyone to P for participate in decisions which affect their human rights, A for the accountability of those responsible for the respect, protection and fulfilment of those human rights, N for non-discrimination and equality, E for empowerment to know their rights and how to claim them and illegality in all decisions through an explicit link with human rights, legal standards in all processes and outcome measures. And it's good to hear from respect to charities such as Age Scotland that progress has been made in recent years in promoting a rights-based approach, but I'm sure across the chamber we can all agree there is still work to be done. 
Presiding officer, many years ago, when I was a young staff nurse, I saw first, at first hand the effects of dementia on people when working in hospitals and in nursing homes, both here and overseas. Most of those I nursed would be considered at the time elderly in their 80s and their 90s. But dementia is not just a condition that affects older adults. It also affects those in their 60s, 50s and even 40s. And by 2031, it's projected that the number of 50-year-olds will have increased by 28%. And so juggling a career and a diagnosis of dementia will become a real issue for many people, families and employers. We are also seeing more relatively younger people with the condition and we need to be prepared to accommodate their particular needs. With the number of people still working when they receive their diagnosis, reasonable adjustments need to be made by workplaces to support a person with dementia, to allow them to continue to work for as long as they want to continue to work. And as James Kelly uh, did in his speech, I welcome Age Concerns work with the STUC to highlight the difficulties many experience with their employers following diagnosis. Dementia fits the criteria of the disability, uh, of disability under the Equalities Act of 2010 and as a consequence employers are legally obliged to make reasonable adjustments to support someone with dementia to work should they wish to do so. Employers need to be more aware of the Charter of Rights for People with Dementia. Dementia Friends is an Alzheimer Scotland initiative which is aimed at not only raising awareness about dementia but also about reducing stigma around the illness and my staff and I have registered with the initiative and I would encourage other MSPs as well as other employers to do so as a first step in being more understanding about dementia as well as how we can make our communities more dementia friendly. Presiding officer, when we value and embed the experience of those with dementia and their carers, as has been done with the Scottish Dementia Working Group and the National Dementia Carers Action Network, we can ensure that the voices of people with dementia are heard and that their rights and concerns are heeded. And I welcome the launch today of the Third Dementia Strategy, which will respond to the increasing proportion of older people with dementia. We'll continue to deliver person-centred treatment and support those with a dementia diagnosis. It's this focus on improving standards by listening to those with dementia, putting them at the centre of their care and working in collaboration with their carers and third sector organisations that will help us improve the quality of life for those with dementia. Thank you. Thank you. I call Jackie Bailey, followed by Miles Briggs. Officer, and can I start with an apology, as I will need to leave um, the chamber before the conclusion of the debate. Presiding officer, it is fitting that we're debating the Charter of Rights for people with dementia and their carers on the day that the Scottish Government has launched their third dementia strategy. Politics is, of course, all about timing, so let me join with others in thanking James Kelly for his foresight in picking this motion for members' business on this day. But let me go back at least four to five years when I first met Tommy Whitelaw. Tommy cared for his mum, Joan, as we've heard, who had vascular dementia until she passed away in 2012. And whilst his story is a moving one, it's actually what Tommy did next that was so inspiring. Now, I have to confess, I thought he was cool anyway, because he was a tour manager and he'd been a band assistant, but what he did next was even cooler, because he used his knowledge, his understanding, and his experience to help others. He kept a blog, and to connect with other dementia carers, started collecting letters. These were their stories, the carers' stories of isolation and loneliness, stories of lack of support and information, but also stories of hope and love. And so began the Tommy on tour campaign as he crossed Scotland collecting letters, demonstrating people's lived experience to the present government. How powerful that was. And it led to action, action in the form of the Dementia Carers' Voices Project run by the Health and Social Care Alliance with government funding, which indeed is always welcome. The project is all about people. It builds on Tommy's tour. It captures the experience of carers across Scotland to shape future policy and provision. It's about raising awareness with health and social care professionals and anyone, anyone at all who is on Twitter, can I recommend you follow Tommy? Because if you do, you'll know that there is nowhere that he has not been. Hospitals, care homes, universities, colleges, all over the place. And aside from being one of the most prolific tweeters that I know, it is the comments from health and social care professionals that are truly impressive. Because, you know, after a talk with Tommy, they understand the challenges faced by carers and just how important a person-centered approach really is. And the recognition that carers are the experts. Who else knows better, if we're honest about it? Because 
Carers bring huge values to society. They also provide care for their loved ones with dementia. And as James Kelly said, 80,000 people spoken to, resulting in 14,000 pledges across the UK. Presiding officer, that's an awful lot of talking. Tommy has, of course, been aided by many people, and I want to mention just one or two. Firstly, Irene Oldfather, a former member of the Scottish Parliament, now a director of the Alliance. For those who don't know, it was, of course, Irene that set up the cross-party group on Alzheimer's and dementia. She championed the Charter of Rights for people with dementia and their carers, and she didn't do it alone, because I see two other colleagues sitting in the chair. Do you know that there is something that former MSPs can do that is really useful, because we have Mary Scanlon, also a former MSP, a member of the same cross-party group. Mary was recently awarded a CBE in the Queen's birthday honours, and very much deserved it was. And then my former colleague, Richard Baker, as well. Um, you know, when, when he is working at Age Scotland now, um, but having a keen interest in this all the way along, but with such, you'll forgive me, Richard, with such formidable women, I have to say, no wonder the Charter was agreed. Because it's about driving culture change. It's about empowering people with dementia. It's about empowering their carers. Taking a rights-based approach is absolutely essential. But there is much more that we still need to do to raise awareness, to increase visibility, and ensure that people can access their rights. Finally, presiding officer, a very small plug. There is a Dementia Care of Carers Voices event in committee room two at 2 p.m. tomorrow. Come along. Join us if you want to hear from Tommy and Irene and others, because frankly, it is so much better than listening to us. I certainly wouldn't say that of your speeches, Ms Bailey. Uh, I call Miles Briggs, we're followed by Colin Smith. Mr Briggs, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to congratulate James Kelly on securing today's debate and also thank those organisations that have contributed useful briefings for today's uh, evening, this evening's debate, including Age Scotland, Alzheimer's Scotland, the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland and Dementia Carers Voices. And it was particularly important to see them in the garden lobby this week as well. And I know many members had a great time chatting to them over some of the personal stories which Jackie Bailey um, pointed towards. I'm pleased that James Kelly's motion has also attracted broad cross-party support, as it's right that all of us in this chamber speak up and promote the rights of people with dementia and those who look after them. The Charter of Rights for People with Dementia and Carers was a very positive initiative, and I pay tribute to all who have helped produce this, including colleagues on the Parliament's cross-party group on dementia who led with this development. I'm particularly pleased to see the three former MSP colleagues here this evening, Irene Oldfather, Mary Scanlon and Richard Baker. Some may say that having left Parliament, they've now entered politics. But, um, I won't go far. Uh, the motion highlights Alliance's Dementia Care of Voices project, and I commend this as an important platform for the voices of the health and social care staff working with people with dementia and their families. As has rightly been said, Tommy Whitelaw is to be congratulated for his efforts and for his passion in campaigning to ensure that no family in Scotland with a family member with dementia goes through the caring journey experiencing loneliness or isolation. As James Kelly has set out today, there's much work to be done to increase people's awareness and understanding of the rights of dementia sufferers and their families and carers. Integrated joint boards need to take a lead and ensure that all staff working with people with dementia are aware of the Charter of Rights and the imperative of a person that their care is centre-based and rights-based. As um, has already been uh, mentioned in this debate, the increase in the number of people under 65 with dementia in this country is a real issue of concern. Figures indicate that the number of people under 65 in Scotland being treated for dementia has risen by a third in the past six years alone. And in 2015-16, in 808 people were diagnosed between the age of 15 and 64 were recorded as having the condition. This is one of the many reasons behind my support for Frank's Law, and I'm pleased to announce that I'll be lodging my Member's Bill proposal on this later this week and looking for support from all parties in order to take this forward. Age Scotland is entirely right to highlight in its briefing for, to, for today's debate that dementia is increasingly an issue for the workplace and not just among, amongst older and retired people. The Scottish Government's 2013 commitment to ensure that all who are diagnosed with dementia receive support from a link worker for one year after their diagnosis was widely welcomed 
But the delivery of this commitment has been patchy across the country, with many still failing to receive it, and with the number of people being diagnosed with dementia expected to go on rising in the year ahead, years ahead, the staffing and, resources of the, and resourcing of this pledge, and indeed dementia care across our NHS, is, very, is a very significant challenge which we all need to be planning for now. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I again very much welcome today's debate and the cross-party support that exists for promoting the rights of dementia sufferers and their families and carers. I welcome the publication of the Scottish Government's third dementia strategy now and, re and recognition of this, of the critical importance of working with and listening to those with dementia and those who care for them. Thank you. Thank you. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Sandra White. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking my colleague James Kelly for tabling his excellent motion, which gives members the opportunity to highlight the importance of a rights-based, person-centred approach to the care of the growing number of people living with dementia and their families and carers. Today in Scotland, 90,000 people are living with dementia, but it's estimated that by 2020 there will be 20,000 new diagnoses each year. It's a condition which often leaves the person who has been diagnosed and their family and carers feeling increasingly powerless, as if they're losing control of their own lives. That's why a rights-based approach must be at the centre of dementia policy, so we can give that control back, give those living with dementia and their families and carers the ultimate say in the care they receive and ensure that care is of the highest standard possible. The Charter of Rights for People with Dementia and their Carers in Scotland has been fundamental in shaping the development of dementia policy and practice since its publication in 2009. It has underpinned key dementia policy development since its agreement. So, like James Kelly, I'd like to pay tribute to the work of Irene Oldfather uh, and the former cross-party group on Alzheimer's, now the, the CPG on Dementia, which I am proud to be vice convener of, in implementing that charter. James Kelly and others have also rightly focused on the excellent work of the Alliance's Dementia Carers Voice project and Jackie Bailey in particular, specifically on the amazing experiences of Tommy and Joan Whitelaw. So I'd like to focus my brief comments on the next step, the long-awaited third dementia strategy, which was published today. That strategy will shape policy until 2020. The vision of the strategy is of a Scotland where people with dementia and those who care for them have access to timely, skilled and well-coordinated support from diagnosis to end of life, which helps achieve the outcomes that matter to them. It's a vision I know everyone in this chamber will share, but we need to turn that vision into a reality. As Alzheimer Scotland said in one of the forwards to the new strategy, the gap between the policy commitments found in all three strategies and the real life experiences of many people is far too wide. Older and Wiser was published in 2008. Remember I'm Still Me was published in 2010. Dignity and Respect published in 2014. Although there has been significant progress, we can't be sitting here at the end of 2020 repeating those words from Alzheimer's Scotland because another policy initiative has not yet been fully implemented. People with dementia simply don't have that time. There's much within the strategy that Labour very much agrees with, from the Missing Persons Initiative to the commitment to improve palliative and end-of-life care. But we believe those positive words must be backed up by adequate government resources. That means scrapping the cuts to local councils, which have impacted severely on social care, so that our social care staff have the time to provide the compassionate care needed, ending the scandal of 50-minute care visits. The implementation of the new strategy must also be properly monitored. Well, there will be a working group to help do this. I hope the Minister will ensure there will be regular reports back to Parliament on progress with the strategy. As the strategy is implemented, it is also crucial that policies are constantly reviewed. There is no doubt that the commitment to one-year post-diagnosis support for people with dementia was very laudable, but it did lack flexibility, and the figures speak for themselves, with only two out of five people benefiting within the government's own target. A key role of the working group and parliamentary scrutiny of the new strategy must be to detect any problems with commitments at an early stage, not wait for three years. Disappointingly, within the 26 pages of the new strategy, there is also no reference to care charges. It is 14 years since the last Labour-led government introduced free personal and nursing care to everyone over the age of 65. However, it is now time to take that policy to the next step. To use the words of the Frank's Law campaign website, no disability, illness, condition or disease waits until a person reaches the age of 65, then strikes. Of the 90,000 people living in Scotland with dementia, 3,000 are under the age of 65. Those 3,000 people face the prospect of having to pay for their own care. So the publication of this strategy is a positive move forward. 
presiding officer. And in concluding, I know there has been much progress made, but there is an awful lot more still to do. Thank you. Thank you. I call Sandra White, we're followed by Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I welcome the guest to the gallery also, which uh, I'll mention uh, shortly as well. Can I congratulate uh, James Kelly for securing this debate, uh, Charter of Rights for People uh, with Dementia and Carers, which uh, basically, as the motion says, uh, James Kelly motion says, it is believes that dementia is everyone's business, and indeed uh, it certainly is. And I thank James for securing this debate. I also welcome the publication of the National Dementia Strategy for Scotland, which uh, was, put, I think, just finished today or published today. And I really look forward to working with the many groups and the cross-party groups in this parliament, which many members in the gallery have been members of. I also my own cross-party group on older people, uh, basically, which has a particular interest uh, in the subject uh, of dementia. Uh, like others, I also would like to thank Irene Oldfather and Tommy Whitelaw for the fantastic work that they not only have carried out, but for what they have actually achieved. And I think that's an important issue we must mention, what they've actually achieved with their work. And I do welcome Mary Scanlon, who I know was a member of the Cross Party Group, and Richard Baker, who also has been leading on this as well. And I thank them very much for the work they, they've achieved. And one of the, is the aims which the cross-party groups put forward and which they have achieved is basically pushing uh, you know, the issue of dementia completely up to the very top of the political ladder. And that's no mean feat to do, but they have certainly pushed it up on that particular ladder as well. And it's actually made it much more informative and uh, professionals as well have become much more aware of the condition of dementia. Uh, professionals such as doctors and others as well. And basically... Uh, Claire Hawkey had mentioned employers, uh, and that's a huge issue there in regarding actually looking at dementia and recognising it and putting forward training uh, for the members of staff. And I think that's something which the people have mentioned already in the groups have actually pushed for. And I think that's something they must be really, really proud of. So it's about what they've achieved as well in, in regards to that. And I know from working with Irene Oldfather and also with, with Tommy Whitelaw as well, uh, a lot of what they pushed forward was from a very personal point of view. And I think that says something, you know, about uh, their integrity and what, what they also went through when they were pushing uh, for, for dementia to be top of the actual ladder. And uh, as I say, once again, I, I thank them very much for that. Uh, from my own experience, uh, my, my mother had dementia, and I know it's very, very difficult. Uh, sometimes you really didn't know what to expect. And apart from achieving the fact that professionals now know and employers too, lots of families didn't know what to expect from dementia uh, and were quite um, left, you know, basically to swim, sink or swim without the information. But certainly the people I've mentioned before and, and the organisations gave us information that we knew not so much what to expect, but we knew what was going on. And there's some families still who are not uh, quite there, and, and I thank them for that as well. There's also, I'm also very proud of my own city, and part of, obviously I represent Glasgow Kelvin, the city of Glasgow, uh, which aims to become a dementia-friendly city, which uh, encourages and uh, develops uh, basically resiliences within communities recognising the impact and the effect that dementia has, not just in maybe you know, a day or a launch, but throughout the, their whole lives, uh, basically within communities, not just the people who suffer from dementia, but their families also, uh, and to enable people with dementia basically to enjoy the best quality of life uh, within their communities and ensure that they are treated with dignity and respect. And I think that's something that's came out of the work which has been done by the many groups and it, Irene and also Tommy's work as well. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. Call Peter Chapman, last speaker in the open debate. Mr Chapman, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I am glad to speak in today's debate, particularly as the Scottish Government's third national dementia strategy has been published today. I thank Alzheimer's Scotland and Alliance's Dementia Carer Voices project for helping to support the production of this charter alongside all the important work they do to support local communities in Scotland and those affected by dementia in any form. I recognise the work of Alzheimer's Scotland in providing community support in my constituency of the North East, 
where they run dementia resource centres, dementia cafes and musical memory groups. And they are continuing to drive change and empowering people with dementia. I think it is clear to say there is an increasing understanding and awareness of the support those diagnosed with dementia require. The Charter of Rights for People with Dementia and their carers in Scotland has influenced the policy and practice that we've seen implemented in the past six years, but there is still a lot we can learn from it. There are an estimated 90,000 people suffering from dementia in Scotland, yet only two in five are eligible for post-diagnostic diagnostic support actually received in 2014-2015. This leads to the question, although the Scottish Government can boast impressive diagnosis rates, why are post-diagnostic care wait lists so long? And although the new strategy continues to pledge a minimum of one year's post-diagnostic support, there is no indication as to how they plan to improve these waiting times. Henry Simmons, the Chief Executive of Alzheimer's Scotland, has commented on the inconsistency in the gap between policy and practice being far too wide. This shows that more needs to be done to ensure strategies are carried out fully and ensure the appropriate support and care is a reality for those living with dementia. As we know, dementia does not discriminate. It can strike at any age, and around 3,200 of those currently diagnosed with dementia are under the age of 65. At present, anyone under the age of 65 who requires personal care for their dementia or any other degenerative brain disease must fund the cost of care themselves. With the charter based on real life experiences, I feel it appropriate to mention Am Amanda Coppell, who lost her husband, Frank Coppell, to dementia in April 2014. And in addition to caring for her husband and losing him to this disease, Ms. Coppell had to face the discriminatory policy that saw her husband ineligible for financial help with care. Frank's condition deteriorated and his need for personal care was evident and Amanda had paid nearly £300 every week for the support he needed. He was due to reach the qualifying age for free care just a few weeks after his death. This has led to Amanda's campaign through the Scottish Government called Frank's Law. Frank's Law is calling for a fairer charging system that provides free personal care for anyone suffering from a degenerative brain disease and not just those over the age of 65. The seventh point of this charter is based on non-discrimination and equality, stating people with dementia and their carers have the right to be free from discrimination based on any grounds such as age, disability, gender, race, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, social or other status. And Amanda's story shows this is currently happening. We must look at the impact dementia has not, on not only those suffering from, with this condition, but for the carers too. Family members are often the chosen carers for those suffering with dementia. And when this happens at an early age, not only has the person suffering with dementia had to leave their job, but the carer will as well. And this leads to the loss of two incomes, with neither at pension age. The Scottish Government's National Dementia Strategy for 2017 to 2020 follows the two previous strategies, mentioning no further plans of providing personal care for those under 65. The new strategy outlines the first main challenge that must be addressed is offering timely, person-centred, coordinated and flexible support that should be consistently available to every person living, living with dementia and their carers. Surely this should mean that those under 65 suffering from dementia should be entitled to the same rights of free personal care. With around 7,780 people suffering with dementia in my constituency in the North May I ask you to East, conclude, Mr I'm Chapman? There, I fully support the Charter of Rights for People with Dementia and Carers. It is safe to say that every community in Scotland is affected by dementia, and I agree with the Charter that dementia is everyone's business and more must be done to provide consistent post-diagnostic support for all ages. Thank you very much. I call on Maureen Watt to close the Government Minister. Seven minutes or thereabouts, please. 
Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I too thank James Kelly for bringing this debate to Parliament uh, today and also for his welcome, as others have done, uh, of the new strategy. Can I also recognise Irene Oldfather in the gallery? When Irene was an MSP, we would share uh, stories ab about how our mother's uh, dementia uh, was progressing. Um, and um, in the contributions today, we have heard the powerful stories on how dementia covers, touches the lives of so many families across the country, as I said, including our, my, my own. And Claire Hockey talked about um, the loss prior to death that, that we experience, and I'm sure that resonates uh, with all. And it's absolutely clear from all the contributions today how a rights-based approach can make a fundamental difference to people living with dementia and their carers. And in preparation for this debate, I read the debate uh, that Irene Oldfather introduced in 2009, and I recognise another contributor in that debate uh, this evening, uh, Mary Scanlon, whose uh, contribution in that debate I, I also read. And I'm sure that both of them, as others have recognised in the chamber tonight, about what a long way we have come since 2009 in improving the care and support of people with dementia. And that includes the introduction of Scotland's, what we shouldn't forget is world-leading post-diagnostic support for everyone newly diagnosed with dementia, improving the skills and capacity of staff, working across health and social care services through our promoting excellence framework, and embracing the principle of personalised dementia care in acute and specialist NHS dementia care settings, and extending carers' rights and support through the Carers Scotland Act of 2016. And all this has been achieved in no small part through the commitment of our partners and health and social care staff working together to improve those outcomes. But that work has been informed by listening to people with dementia, their families, carers and staff. Their experiences, like as Jackie Bailey highlighted, that of Tommy Whitelaw and his caring for his late mother Joan, who helped us identify what was working well and what could be improved. And while much of the work in Scotland, particularly around post-diagnostic support, is recognised as world-leading, there's a shared view that we can go further. So over the last two years, we've worked closely with people affected by dementia and our partners to develop Scotland's third dementia strategy for 2017 to 2020. And I'm grateful for all the contributions and support from all those involved, including the National Dementia Carers Action Network and the Scottish Dementia Working Group, amongst others whom I have met over the period. And our strategy sets out 21 commitments, which, as in the previous strategy, are underpinned by a rights-based approach. They focus on improving the quality of care across the whole care pathway, from diagnosis to the provision of person-centred care for people at the end of their lives. And importantly, it focuses on the needs of carers at every stage of the journey. And it also stresses the need for as early diagnosis as possible so that the person with the diagnosis can be at the centre of the decision making about their ongoing care. And I think that's really important. So our shared vision is for a Scotland where people with dementia and those who care for them have access to timely, skilled and well-coordinated support from, from diagnosis to end of life which helps to achieve the outcomes that matter to them. Together with our national and local partners, we will work to ensure that the ambitions contained in this strategy are realised. But it's not just about this strategy in isolation. Improving care and support for people affected by dementia is really everyone's business. So we're committed to implementing a range of other related policy ambitions which reinforce our vision and strategy. Improving support for carers is one of those areas. So from next April, the Carers Scotland Act will bring new rights and support for carers, 
ensuring that they can continue to care if they so wish in better health and to have a life alongside caring. Carers will have a right to an adult carer support plan or young carer, support state, or young carer statement to identify their needs and personal outcomes. Local authorities will have a duty to support carers based on their identified needs which meet, lo which meet local eligibility criteria and to consider whether that support should include a break from caring. And there will be new requirements for carers to be involved in decisions about discharge from hospital of the person they care for and for carers' views to be taken into account in community care assessments. And we will shortly be consulting on a carer's charter setting out all the rights for carers under the Act to be, to be published before the Act takes effect in a, next April. I know integration authorities, carer organisations are working hard to prepare for the Act. And I also want to acknowledge some of the other initiatives we are supporting, such as respitality with hosp hospitality businesses gifting short breaks for carers, coordinated by local carers centres and Shared Care Scotland. We're also committed to increasing carers' allowance to the same level as job seekers' allowance, covering the period from April 2018. And more widely, I'm pleased that the Dementia Carers' Voices Project, which is managed by the Alliance, has involved over 70,000 NHS staff, care home staff and students on the Make a Difference Pledge campaign. This campaign supports the objectives of the Charter of Rights for People with Dementia and their carers, which seeks to ensure participation, accountability, equality, empowerment and legality across services. And I'm pleased that there's also been considerable advances in local areas in developing and embedding dementia-friendly community initiatives, including in Motherwell, the Highlands, Stirling, Edinburgh and Prestwick. These initiatives bring people from across communities to work together to help people with dementia to remain a part of their community. And I was particularly pleased to see some of these initiatives within supermarkets, for example, in Forest and Murray, where a supermarket has piloted a relaxed, a relaxed checkout to support people with dementia and others who need extra time at the till. And several members have in, uh, talked about meeting the post-diagnostic support. And earlier today, I visited St. Trid Triduan's Medical Practice in Portobello in northeast Edinburgh, where I met staff who will be testing the value of delivering post-diagnostic support in primary care. That will hopefully improve accessibility for people with dementia and their carers. And I think more uh, improved accessibility with joined up care with a link worker will mean quicker diagnosis and thereafter quicker support being put in place. Uh, members also mentioned uh, Frank's Law and as most members will know, the government is carrying out a feasibility study uh, into looking how to extend free personal care to everyone under the age of 65, regardless of their medical conditions, not just um, those with dementia. And the study is being taken forward by Scottish government officials and is due to be completed uh, this summer. And of course, we'll share those findings with Parliament. We're seeking views to inform the feasibility study and officials are holding meeting with stakeholders um, to feed into the study. We also have to work with COSLA and we have issued a questionnaire to local authorities to gather up-to-date information to inform the study. So I, I'm sure we'll all be interested in seeing what that brings forward. But today, presiding officer, today's debate has been provided us with another opportunity for us all to recognize the importance of a rights-based approach to improving the lives of people affected by dementia in Scotland. And I want to close by reiterating, reiterating this government's commitment to continuing to do, adopt such an approach as we work with partners and those affected themselves by dementia in realising the ambitions of our third strategy. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.